Hello and welcome to Monet Cafe. I'm artist Susan Jenkins. We're gonna have some fun today and if you're new here, please subscribe and hit that little bell icon to be notified of future videos. Oh, I think you guys are going to be excited about this video where I am providing 12 soft pastel techniques and a lot more. I even create this little painting at the end, so stay tuned. I am so happy to know that Monet Cafe here on YouTube has inspired many artists to come over to the medium of soft pastels, but because it's a little different than other mediums, we often get confused about mark making, how to use it, how is it different from other mediums. So I'm going to take you through this tutorial and show you, uh, this is some black paper that I'll be doing some mark making on, and I'm just showing you here some of the little quick, I call them pastel sketches that I've done actually just on unsanded black Canson paper. And because soft pastel is different from other mediums in that we don't use a brush, we use our hands and these earthen vessels we get to hold, it's very important to know the different marks that we can make to achieve different effects and results. Here's another painting. You can see various stroke work and I've used multiple techniques that you will see in this video to achieve the different and painterly results. So let's get ready to learn more about pastel techniques and I encourage you to follow along with me. I'm going to show you right now how to prepare your own surface with the 12 different divisions for these techniques. As you can see at the beginning of this video, I'm using a pad of black Canson paper. I'm using a Posca acrylic marker. I love these markers. They come in black and white. They may come in other colors too, but I thought this black Canson paper would be a dynamic and easy way for you to see these pastel techniques. So basically, use whatever you have. Divide your paper into 12 equal portions and label it accordingly. Now I'm a lefty and when I, I don't paint this way, but when I write, I do the typical curve my hand over like that. So you'll be able to see this. I'm just speeding this up literally to write these in and I'm going to demonstrate each one of these right now. The first technique is blending and it is one that is quite common to pastel painting. And the neat thing about blending is that you actually can get interesting combinations with color. A lot of people think that because pastels are a dry medium that we can't get mixing of colors like with wet mediums, but we actually can get some effects of mixing color that you will see in just a minute like magic. All right, so I have my blue. These are harder new pastels just so you know. And again, Canson is an unsanded paper, but watch what happens when I just use pastels to blend themselves here over the blue. Do you see how that turned a little bit to green? So we do have the ability to get a little bit of color mixing with pastels and you'll see more of this with some of the other techniques. Now keep in mind with blending, sometimes the end result is affected by which color you put down first. For example, if I put my blue pastel down first, it's kind of a teal pastel, and then the yellow on top of it. Now because these are harder pastels, they kind of blend themselves. Um, harder pastels have a tendency to do that. But now notice I put the yellow down first and then the blue. And I noticed in my example, it's not as extreme. It would be more extreme if I had rubbed the beneath layer with my finger a little bit more. You would have seen a, um, more of a dramatic difference between the two. Now I'll do one more example here where I'm going to show you some of the different tools that you can use for blending. You see how you can actually use pastels to blend themselves, but you can also use other tools to do the blending for you. In this case, I'm putting down the yellow and the teal color and then I will blend using three different methods. The first method is simply using your finger. The next method I'll demonstrate will be with a piece of pipe foam insulation that you can get at any hardware store. It's a really neat blending tool and also I've been lately using a piece of chamois cloth. I'll go more into when to use that and when not to. All right, so let's just use the finger technique. It does work great, but keep in mind some people say they rub their finger raw. I have callous fingers from playing guitar, so it doesn't bother me that much, but you do get kind of different effects with each one even though it doesn't show up quite as much on this Canson paper. That that's the pipe foam insulation. And then last is the chamois cloth. Now the chamois cloth works better on papers that aren't overly sanded. And again, I'll describe more about that later. All right, the next example is going to be broken color. I happen to really like this one. 
I think it's because I really like the illusion of color mixing. So in this example, we're not blending the colors as we did in the first one. But this technique will give an illusion of a new color by the close proximity of the marks next to each other. Now you see I'm just making kind of small random marks first in the teal and then in the yellow and I'm going to go in with the opposite color for each one and you'll see how the technique does give a, an illusion of almost a green. Now the pastel does uh, go over some of the blue. You don't have to be so specific and get it right in the spaces that you've created. But I think this technique gives a painterly and energetic style and definitely a different end result than just blending the two colors together. I use this technique a lot in painting and I just, I don't always have to have the marks so specific like this, but just gestural little lines of color next to each other will create this dynamic and fun result. Broken color is also a similar technique that I use often when painting skies. Rather than just doing a blended sky, as in the first example, I like to use colors of a similar value and the same strategy as broken color to create a more interesting sky. And the way this is done is, notice in this example, I'm not making my marks as um, small or specific. I just lay down some color with various gestural strokes, and then I lay down another color on top of it, amongst it, in and around it, that's of a similar value. Value just means lightness or darkness of a color and it creates a more interesting color rather than just using your finger or blending the two colors together. Now the next technique is hatching and cross hatching. This is a technique that's often used in drawing. If you've done any drawing, you've probably used this technique to get various um, methods of shading. And the neat thing about pastels is it works as a drawing and a painting medium. So this is the hatching example I just did, but you can also do it with little marks that are um, kind of turned in different ways, little hatching marks, and you just kind of vary their direction to create a little pattern of sorts. Now cross hatching is just what it sounds like. We're gonna do the same little hatching marks. And by the way, I always recommend to practice these things. You get better and more consistent at your lines being um, consistent, which mine were not so consistent. I was working around my camera. If you guys could see my setup, sometimes when I do these demos, it's crazy. So I decided to use a different color to do the cross hatching, just so you could still get that illusion of mixed color. Now, the next technique is called feathering. And I really like this technique. If you've ever seen artwork where it's a painting and it looks like every line is kind of going in the same direction, um, that's one way you can do feathering. I'm going to show you that here. I'm basically just making a lot of lines all going diagonally from top to bottom, from the right to the left. And I'm going to kind of create a little painting within this. Now, I want to describe as I'm doing this, feathering also works quite well for doing animal fur um, or doing hair or doing grasses. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm still keeping my strokes all in the same direction, but I'm making myself a little tree uh, kind of within the lighter blue that I use. Now I'm going to add a different color. I'm going to give a little yellow to the sky here. I didn't have a lot of pastels sitting near me that were the right colors and values so I I jumped up real quick and got some more I needed something a little darker to indicate that tree so again this is something that it's a beautiful technique when people do it correctly but this can also be done not just to create a painting with the feathering technique but to create little areas using feathering like I said with animal fur, hair, grasses, etc. Now the next technique is one that I use quite often. It's the side stroke. Like I said before about pastels being able to be used as a drawing medium, they can be used as a painting medium by using more of the broad side of the pastel. I often break my pastels in half so that I have shorter areas, but I keep some of them longer and I've learned that I can make side strokes not the full length of the pastel without even having to break them if I kind of lift up on the back side of it. You can see how I'm doing that there. Also another important point to make about all of these techniques is 
pressure. We have the ability to control our stroke and our results based on how hard or soft we're pressing with the pastel, as you can see in the stroke that I made here. The next technique is obviously similar to the one we just did. It is still a side stroke, but we have the ability to layer our side strokes. And I, again, I use this technique a lot. I like using the broad side of the pastel, and then you can do the same thing. I'm just uh, reversing the colors here. Once again, you see how that creates kind of a new color? I thought this was a good time for me to describe why I prefer a layering technique rather than a blended technique. In this little example, you can see the blended color is on the left side. The layered color is on the right side. When we blend colors together, we often crush the little particles within soft pastels that give them their gorgeous color, and the end result can come out muddy or dull. I find that minimal blending is okay sometimes at beginning stages of a painting, but the final result is so much more vibrant if we use the layering technique that you can see on the right. The next technique is pointillism. It's similar to broken color, but the mark making is a bit smaller. They're really like little dots. So I'm gonna do the same thing I did with broken color. First, applying little dots, random. Now, they don't have to be equidistant apart. And actually, to me, they are more painterly and artistic if they're not so patterned and consistent. And in this first example, I've given my points a little breathing room. They're not so close together, so I'm keeping them more spacious. I'm claustrophobic, so I would rather be one of these points than the next one I'm going to make. And here you can see that my points are now, in the next example, a lot tighter, closer together. And what happens as a result of that is you get a little bit more of the illusion of a new color. When they are so spacious, you kind of see the teal and the yellow, but now you can see it does make a little bit more of a green when they're closer in proximity to each other. The next technique is scumbling, another favorite of mine, and I think it is because of the randomness of the strokes. Now, again, my left-handedness, you can't quite see what I'm doing here, but you will in a minute. I'm basically making little squiggly marks, just kind of random, uh, kind of turning the marks um, in different directions as I go. And I'm gonna do the same thing as the pointillism example. I'm going to make the second example a bit tighter in proximity with my marks. And again, it will create more of an illusion of a new color because of things being so close together. The next technique is called a twist or twisting. Often we can create energetic marks by just turning our hands to create a ribbon type of an effect. And again, this is using the broad side of the pastel as opposed to the point. And again, back to the drawing element of soft pastels. And I like to remind people to keep a gestural quality and a stroke to your hand. Allow your hand, hold your pastel very gently, allow your hand to move with the pastel. And also, in the next example, I'll talk about controlling the pressure. But in this example, I'm just creating strokes in a free and flowing method. Now I'd also like to mention that I often don't use drawing elements or techniques to a painting until more towards the end. I use bigger, broader stroke work at the beginning of a painting. We often say in art that we go big to small. We work large, big shapes and block in our basic big forms before we get too detailed. This next technique focuses on rolling of a pastel. If you've got a nice round pastel, why not utilize the beauty of being able to roll it. You're gonna get different line widths and pressures as you roll it around and you get a randomness that I think you will immediately notice the difference between this technique 
and the drawing technique that I just used before. There's a brokenness to things in nature. That sounds poetic, doesn't it? <laughs> but there is a brokenness. Our world has fallen and it's not perfect anymore. But I better not get to preaching. I'll stick with art. Now let's talk about pressure. Oh no, that's another thing I could get philosophical about. No, seriously, pressure is the same as the example I did before about how we have the ability to change pressures and it really does create more of an artistic style. Once again, when my left-handedness gets out of the way here, notice the mark making in this technique in rolling in pressure and how it differs from the drawing technique. So I really love being able to use these uh, different techniques to create more of a painterly and artistic style. This last technique, dusting, is a lot of fun. I don't have many times when I need to use it, but it's a perfect technique if you need to create things such as stars, snow, or even fireflies. So what I'm doing, I'm using actually my lemon zester. I use it for ginger too. And I'm just grating little bits of pastel onto the surface. And I'm going to use various colors for this example. Now I'm using a teal. So I'm using lavender, teal, and I believe a yellow. Now you may be thinking, well, how is that pastel going to stay on that surface? Won't it just blow off? And of course it would if I didn't do what I'm about to do. I'm using a piece of glassine. Now you could use wax paper for this example or tracing paper. You're really just putting something down that you can put pressure on top of. In my case, I've in the past I've used a wine bottle, but in this case I, I just grabbed a glass. So I'm just using anything rounded and hard to press down pretty hard on my dusted pastels and sure enough, they will stay. I've done this technique multiple times, but in one example, I did it for a galaxy, uh, like a nebula, if you've ever seen that effect, and it worked really well for all of those mini stars. Now I'm gonna go ahead and blow, and I know you can't see what I just did, but I blew and nothing came off. So this technique really does work nicely. So those were 12 of the many techniques that we can use with pastel mark making. And now let's talk about erasing pastels. Can it be done? Yes, pastels can be removed. We can use multiple tools. This is a kneaded eraser, which feels a bit like a piece of putty. This is an older one, that's why it's darker, but you can sort of clean the eraser by stretching it and uh, molding it to get a new area. Now we can also use a stiff bristle brush. This is a regular paintbrush, but you can use a really stiff brush to get a lot of the pastel off. Now, I have already blended this one in, so it's not gonna come off as good as some of the stroke work I had done where I didn't press it with my finger or another blending tool. See how this one removes a bit better. I just blew some of the pastel off. So we can remove a bit of the pastel by using a stiff bristle brush, but I do find that the kneaded eraser works quite well. So watch how after brushing off the majority of the pastel, when I use the eraser, and once again, I keep um, stretching it to get a new part of the eraser to work from, because it gets kind of dirty with the pastel, you just keep um, stretching it and molding it. And but I can continue to use this technique and process to get a lot of the pastel off the surface. Now this technique also works a bit better on the blended portion, more so than the brush that I used before. You can see that it still does do a bit of erasing. Now there is one other technique that you can use to say rescue a failed painting and it's using water. However, I can't do it on this surface. This is not a water friendly surface. So stay tuned, we'll be getting to that. And with that perfect segue, let's talk about some of the different pastel surfaces that we can work on. Some of them are water friendly, some are not, some are sanded, some are unsanded, and there's just so much to choose from. So let's first talk about sanded versus unsanded. A common unsanded surface for many pastel artists, and usually one of the first things you try on your new pastel journey is Canson Mitons. It's a French word. I used to say that word wrong all the time, but it's a great surface. It doesn't give a lot of layering, but once again, unsanded papers have their advantages. 
I have a video tutorial where I literally create the same painting on a sanded and an unsanded surface. I'll try to put a card up here, a link to that video. Now also, Canson started making a paper that's a bit sanded and it's called, look for the word touch. It's Canson Mitons Touch and it has a slight sanded surface. Now let's talk about some sanded surfaces that you can get for pastel painting and some of the advantages. One of my favorite sanded surfaces is by Sennelier, another French word. They also make soft pastels and this surface is pretty coarse, but it's great for animal portraits and landscapes, comes in different colors. Keep in mind, this is not a water friendly surface, so you can't do the technique I'll mention later about repurposing your pastel painting. A surface that I've really come to love lately is pastel matte. Now this is a white piece of pastel matte, but it comes in different colors. It also is a type of sanded surface, not nearly as sanded as the Sennelier. This is a water friendly paper. You can literally wash your painting off and even give a little scrub to it. So that is a great advantage to this paper. Now this is another water friendly paper with a bit more of a sanded surface called U-Art paper. It comes comes in different grades or grits as you can see in the photo and it's also great for washing off a painting and repurposing. Now I have found that U-Art paper often curls on me so I've started using another brand almost just like U-Art paper called Fisher and I get the 400 grit and it doesn't curl or warp at all. Now, since many of the pastel papers are water friendly, let's talk about pastels and water. I was very surprised early in my pastel journey to learn that you can wet pastels and you can use water or alcohol and yes, even gin or vodka qualifies. I get that question all the time. This is a little Mr. Spritzer bottle I have that has alcohol in it and I'm going to demonstrate now some different methods of combining soft pastels and water or alcohol. Now this is the piece of U-Art paper, once again very similar to Fisher paper. And first to demonstrate, I'm just applying, that's a broken Sennelier, it was kind of dirty too, um, just applying some pastel to the surface. That's a big Terry Ludwig pastel. And this is a Diane Townsend, look at that gorgeous green. And while this isn't a lesson on the different types of pastel, it is kind of neat to see some of them. This is a Mount Vision iridescent pastel. It actually does have some sparkle in it. You can't see it great here. Now, here is the reason why not to use a cheap brush. I grabbed a brush real quickly and it's so cheap that bristles were coming off. So I grabbed one of my better brushes to finish this exercise. Now, I'm just using water here. I have a paper towel sometimes to kind of control my water. Sometimes I have a little too much and so I'm gradually going from more water to less water in that example. Now I'm just applying a bunch of water to this Diane Townsend one. You can see how luscious that works. It also works great with the Mount Vision and you can combine colors as well. So pastels really can work like watercolor. And in this example you can see how I applied the pastel first and then added the water but I'll show you soon how you can literally use pastels like little watercolor uh, palettes and paint the water right on the pastel to grab some color and put it down on your surface. For the next water friendly demonstration, I'm using pastel matte. Sorry for the little teeny piece. I didn't want to ruin a whole big sheet. I'm so frugal. <laughs> so in this one, I am also putting down the pastel first and like I made the little note before, I like the white surface of pastel matte because I can tone my papers any color that I want. I'm not restricted to what the company provides for me. I'm speeding this one up because it's the same technique that I used before, but this one is just on the pastel matte. Now for this example, I am once again using a little teeny piece of pastel matte and I'm doing a different technique. This time, I'm putting the water directly on the pastel and you can see that it works better on different brands of pastels. I am gonna do another video. I have one already that's older on different brands of pastels and some of the uh, things that I love about all of them really. But you can see here how the end result is a little bit different when you use the pastel almost like a little paint tube to work from.
Now let's talk about another surface that is definitely water friendly. It's watercolor paper. I use watercolor paper so often because I know it is a cheaper alternative for many artists who are starting. It's easy to come by. You can find it anywhere. And I'm using alcohol in this example to do a similar technique of applying the pastel and then adding water or alcohol, alcohol in this case, to this uh, little swatch of watercolor paper. Now what I'm doing, I'm using the spritzer and I'm watching the drips happen. I actually really love doing things like this on watercolor paper to create an interesting underpainting to begin a painting. You see I can still blend the different pastel colors with a brush afterwards if you want to. And also I'll try to put a card above to a video I have of how you can make this into a pastel surface with various techniques. And this is another neat little technique you can do with watercolor paper or any water friendly paper where I like to embrace the drips and sometimes you can use gravity in your favor. In this case, I'm turning it upside down after spritzing it with alcohol and creating some tree trunks uh, by the, the random method that they kind of flow and then adding a little bit extra. So there's so many different things that you can do using water and alcohol with soft pastels. Wow, we really covered a lot of material in this video and it was a lot of fun. I hope you've learned a lot, but now it's time to combine all of these things for an actual painting. So I'm using a little baby piece again of pastel matte. This is the white again, and I'm just gonna use the pastels that I have sitting right next to me. I'm also going to demonstrate another question I get all the time about spray fixative, when to use it and when not to use it. I will use it later in the painting. So I'm really speeding this one up here because the video is getting kind of long, but I'm showing you how I just kind of used a layering technique there. Now I'm using a blending technique with a chamois cloth to kind of get in a value study. I'm just doing this out of imagination. And once again, only with the pastels that I have next to me. So you don't have to have all these huge sets sometimes. If you've got enough color and value. Value is key. I have lots of videos on that. I decided to tape this down. So now I'm using a lighter value for the sky, kind of doing a fractured sky like in one of the techniques at the beginning of the video. And now I'm using water because this is a water friendly paper, the pastel matte paper. Now I'm using the technique of value and color temperature. Oh, I have another video on that. And uh, adding some of these blues, some cooling off the trees in the background, and lots of other techniques such as scumbling, broken color. And by the way, I hope you will subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like a little more instruction or to support this channel, please consider supporting me on my Patreon page. It keeps these videos coming for free to so many people who wanna learn more about pastel painting. And now I'm adding some luscious reds. I do think I went and grabbed a little bit of a darker red. With flowers, it's often good to put down a darker value and then a little bit of a brighter value on top of it. And this was fun. This is literally like a little bookmark size, um, which was kind of neat. And now is when I'm actually going to use the spray fixative. I'm using Blair Low Odor Fixative, and you can't see my hand in this, but I'm angling it to where I'm just spraying a little bit of that foreground. Things are darker in value in the foreground. And what the fixative does is it darkens the foreground, which works artistically. And also it gives you a little bit more of a layering capability. Now, the question I get often about fixative and pastel painting is, do you fix your painting at the end? I never do a final coating of fixative at the end of a painting. I only use it in my favor to darken an area or to add a little bit more layering. So now I'm using a little bit of the, the stroke, the drawing, or you could call it the feathering technique, various different techniques from the examples that I showed earlier. I love adding teals and uh, cooler colors in grasses. And here I'm using another new pastel, kind of using the rolling and the uh, pressure technique I talked about before, keeping it very loose and carefree is the word I like to use. Grasses don't grow in patterns. They usually are very flowing and free. So I hope you guys loved that. So please like this video and comment. I'd love to know what you think. It really does help my YouTube standing and to make my videos suggested more often. So try some of these techniques. And if you're a patron of mine, please share it in our homework album. You know what I'm talking about, patrons. All right, guys, happy painting and come back soon.